Hello, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Analyze This, Mr. Bond, my channel where I look at the adventures of fictional super spy James Bond 007 and dig beneath the surface. This is part two of my series on the Pierce Brosnan Bond films. As we discussed in part one, where we discussed Goldeneye, the Pierce Brosnan era was tasked with reestablishing the character after a period of what honestly might be considered decline. Uh, Bond's cultural popularity had peaked with The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, and since that point, it had been mostly not a, a straight linear descent, but there was a sense of decline in popularity for the character. And after License to Kill in 1989, there was a big question mark about whether the character would be relevant again. Pierce Brosnan established in GoldenEye that with, without a doubt that this character was going to be a force to be reckoned with both at the box office and as a cultural icon. And Tomorrow Never Dies, in many ways, picks up where GoldenEye left off. Before we get into it, I'll be honest that Tomorrow Never Dies is not my favorite Brosnan Bond movie. I have a lot of nostalgia for it. It was the first Bond film that I was aware of as a cultural event. It came out around the same time as the Nintendo 64 game GoldenEye. For people of my generation, that was a big moment for Bond. Uh, that put Bond on my radar. The, the first Bond movies I actually saw were the Sean Connery Bond movies. My dad made me watch those before I saw anything with Pierce Brosnan in it. So, uh, Tomorrow Never Dies looms large in my memory. I loved it. Uh, at the time, but now with Distance, I find it a fairly weak installment. It has some very nice things about it. It's paced uh, in a fun, energetic way. It moves well. There's a lot of good uh, humor, some good Bond moments along the way, but I, I find that it's lackluster in a few areas. First and foremost, I think it, it lacks a lot of the exoticism I look for from a Bond movie. The locations are not the height of Bondian glamour. Uh, you don't see a lot of people traveling to Hamburg just to go check out Tomorrow Never Dies uh, locations. Um, you know, it, it's mostly a lot of, of steel, glass, concrete interiors across the course of the movie. I mean, to encapsulate it, it's big, grand action sequence. The car chase is set in the concrete interior of a car park. It's a fun sequence, but it's not exactly eye candy. Um, I think the story's pretty weak. We'll talk about this a little bit, but I think it's it's built on a pretty implausible premise that Britain would be uh, going to war with such uh, a large uh, military force as that of the Chinese military. Um, and the other big piece about the story that's kind of disappointing is it doesn't do a lot with its central hook, which is that the villain controls mass media and news stories. It, it's obviously a part of the story, but it's mostly window dressing. You don't get a lot of what might potentially have been really fun with that story, like uh, Bond's name appearing in the press and him being framed and having to go on the run, or, or the villain using the news to uh, you know, interrupt Bond's investigation, things like that, that could have been really exciting and interesting. In many ways, Elliot Carver, the villain of Tomorrow Never Dies, could just be any other uh, techno-industrialist. And then I think the the other really big issue with this movie is, is just that Michelle Yeoh, as wonderful as she is, and I love her to death, um, and Waylon is a fun character, she and Pierce Brosnan do not really have a lot of chemistry. So, uh, the, you know, it, it, they seem they seem like good partners, but not romantic partners. And the the movie's attempt to kind of put them in that lane is is less than optimal. All in all, fun movie, but I think it's considerably weaker than its predecessor, Goldeneye. And now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about what I really do uh, find interesting about Tomorrow Never Dies. So first and foremost, it opens with a pretty pretty solid pre-title sequence that picks up right where Goldeneye left off. We are at a terrorist arms bazaar on the Russian border. Weapon smuggling is a consistent trope in the Pierce Brosnan Bond movies. The Pierce Brosnan Bond movies and 
the way they have positioned Bond as this character who bridges two orders of two moments in history, like the peak of the Cold War and its aftermath. You get the sense that weapon smuggling is a stand-in for the way that the villains in these series are operating in uh, the the shadows and crumbling corners of what was a former empire, right? So weapon smuggling shows up uh, as a topic in Goldeneye. It's a big opening point here in Tomorrow Never Dies. It shows up again in The World Is Not Enough and at the opening of Die Another Day. So it's, it, in many ways, it is a pretty consistent through line here that villainy in the Pierce Brosnan era is tied to this opportunistic and sinister utilization of the um, kind of remaining surplus of weaponry that was developed during the Cold War. And this sort of uh, economy of weapons trading that's that kind of exists in the background in the Pierce Brosnan Bond movie is a representation of that sort of uh, dissolution of that prior global order. Um, one other piece that's introduced very early in Tomorrow Never Dies and picks up a little bit from Goldeneye too is this idea that uh, the internet and the technologies associated with it are are a new pathway to villainy here. We had Boris in Goldeneye. Now we have uh, Ricky Jay's Gupta in Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, again, a less, a less interesting character than Boris in a lot of ways, but it's the similar role. And it, again, you're going to get another techie henchman in Die Another Day enabling the villain to do his sort of like high-tech sci-fi designs a little bit more cartoonish in Die Another Day than the technologies explored in Golden Nine Tomorrow Never Dies but it's again this consistent theme that it's 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 technological innovation plus the kind of uh weaponry of the old age that that is enabling these villains to, to uh, inflict their schemes upon the world. Um, so at the core of this is you have this tension between Britain and China. And I, I think it's drawn in the movie in a way that is very silly. Original drafts made a little bit more sense that this was, the story was originally going to be focused on the handover of Hong Kong, which was happening at this time, um, they moved away from it because they didn't want to anchor it in a true historical event because that dates the film. So they went for a more universal sense of conflict. Um, I think it, that's an unfortunate choice. I think it's a less interesting choice. I think it would have been very interesting to have a Bond movie anchored in a particular historical moment like the Hong Kong uh, handover. Um, however, you still get a lot of that baggage. So the Bond movies here, with this Bond in particular, finding his place in the new geopolitical order, the other piece of that is that the, the old order is largely an order shaped by nations like Britain. And so there's a lot of uh, baggage about British Empire in the East in this confrontation between Britain and China. It doesn't get discussed a lot in the finished film, certainly not in the way that it's very explicit in GoldenEye, where Bond's friend and now villain 006 is a product of a prior betrayal by the British government. Uh, we don't get any sort of direct angle here in that way for this story, but it's kind of lurking beneath the surface, especially given that this was coming out in 1997. Um, Bond in this is given one of the most heroic presentations the character has ever been. He's introduced with the code name White Knight, and I think White Knight is a good way to think of Pierce Brosnan's Bond overall. This is a much more heroic, uh, warm, sympathetic version of the character than we had in prior installments. He's almost uh, valiant, is the word. I would think of, um, you know, in the movies, David Arnold's score does a lot to emphasize that sort of 
anthemic heroic quality for this version of the character. Um, again, we're seeing him be the, what I said in the GoldenEye video, the kind of movie star Bond, this sort of classic elegance combined with this sort of like modern, at the time, modern like late 90s, business class elegance. Pierce Brosnan's attire in this movie is phenomenal. He has some of the most amazing ties. He's wearing rich camel coats. Um, his dinner suit, his three-piece dinner suit is probably my favorite dinner suit look outside of the original one worn by Sean Connery and Dr. No, excluding, excluding, you know, I love some of the, uh, the white dinner jacket looks, especially the one in, in Octopussy worn by Roger Moore. But I, I, for that traditional black dinner jacket look, and in this case it's midnight blue, both for Dr. No and, and in Tomorrow Never Dies, I think that three-piece look, it's extra grand, it's extra luxurious. Again, we've talked about how this Brosnan bond has this affection for luxury that feels like he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. There's a little bit of a, an aristocratic quality to him. Um, you know, he has this sort of feeling like he is a trust fund kid that went into the Navy and ended up as a sort of playboy spy right like there that that's kind of how he dresses that's kind of how he lives on his downtime again as in goldeneye we see a little bit of him uh on his off time before he's called into the office and you're getting this sense of this very glamorous playboy character that brosnan leans into um so well and one of the things that i do like about what tomorrow never dies does in a way that um Goldeneye played with, but I think Brosnan just wasn't as comfortable leaning into it, is Brosnan has a wonderful talent for just sort of playing around with language and enjoying the sort of musical qualities of, of phrasing. Um, one of the best line deliveries he has in this movie is when he's prodding Elliot Carver about... Uh, the the ship that's been lost at sea and he, he the way he just says lost at sea adrift uh is just so kind of smug and and self-satisfied and amused and it's it's really honestly a lot of fun and it makes you wish that uh he had more dialogue like that to work with across the series i think at the point in time where the, he was playing the character, there was a tension to, do we lean into the melodramatic aspects of the character? Do we lean into the more uh, comic aspects of the character's persona? And you see a lot of capability for Brosnan to play with, with humor and dialogue exchanges that I like. It shows up a lot in his relationship with Paris Carver, which we should absolutely talk about here, because... We've talked about how this is a Bond who, for the first time in this series, has a strong sense of personal history. It's it's a sort of like mostly geopolitical history, but there's this sense of personal history too. In the first movie, he's fought his friend. In the next movie, we are catching up with one of his old lovers, Paris Carver, now married to the villain. That's a great setup. Uh, I unfortunately think that Love Triangle is, a, is too short-lived in the movie but it is a great setup and it is a it gives Brosnan a lot of fun stuff to play with as he's playing off of Perry, Paris Carver who is played by Terry Hatcher um I really enjoy these sort of interactions the two of them have together um I think they have a nice easy chemistry together that's and you see with Brosnan, a very sort of easy vulnerability. We talked about how in the GoldenEye video, how Brosnan's bond is very emotionally accessible. And one really good example of that in Tomorrow Never Dies is, is the very tender scene where Paris comes to meet Bond in his hotel room. And I wanna give Brosnan all the credit in the world. The scene, the bit where Brosnan's just throwing back shots of vodka, waiting for what he thinks is going to be an assassin to just come after him that night is is quintessential uh 
Bond. It's glamorous. He's got his tuxedo shirt undone. There's just... It it just feels like everything about Bondian fantasy, the allure of danger, uh, mixed with this sort of luxury glamour, and then you bring in Paris Carver into it, and you get the romance and the sensuality of the Bond fantasy all in one unique moment. And then it tilts towards the melodrama that the world is not enough will lean into fully. It is the most melodramatic Bond movie of this run. But uh, here with Paris Carver, there's one moment where she says, did I get too close, too close for comfort? And you see Bond think about how to respond before he replies yes. And Brosnan communicates in one moment Bond's entire thought process as he reacts to her remark, processes it, and then realizes she's right and responds. And Brosnan is very good at taking that sort of inner monologue and just playing it out in facial expressions and body language gestures. And again, you're seeing that very much in their relationship. Um, there's that sort of vulnerability, again, can lean into some of the ways that he ex expresses like personal tension. You see that in the scene with Dr. Kaufman where if you're really paying attention to how Brosnan's playing that scene, he's barely keeping it together. Um, he's just so kind of distraught. Obviously, Paris is is dead next to him, and he's confronting her killer in the same room, uh, trying to navigate his way out of a difficult situation. Um, again, a very well done scene, uh, a scene that plays with humor in an interesting way, but is also like very emotionally complex for the Bond character. Um, and Brosnan plays that uh, very well, right up until the moment where he gets the satisfaction of revenge. Um, unfortunately, I think this movie is much less successful than Goldeneye in keeping those emotional threads running through the story. Uh, Paris Carver exits the picture, and while she, her d death is brought up in subsequent moments in the movie, it is the kind of thing where it's kind of like a hand wave. Um, even the action sequence that follows her death, Bond eventually gives over to sort of like giddy exuberance as he's piloting the car from the back, back seat using his mobile phone gadgetry, and then is, you know, it's it's... This is the kind of movie where it's very quick to leave behind that emotional beat. I, I, there's a version of this movie that exists in an alternate universe uh, where it's really more about that relationship and that relationship is sustained throughout this movie, a kind of like ongoing love triangle between Paris and Bond and the villain. And that would have been a much more, I think, fulfilling for me version of this movie, regardless of how you feel about it. Um, so I, I really like that dynamic and I really like what we've gotten with Pierce Brosnan in that scene because it does showcase Brosnan Bond's particular particular scent brand of like romantic tenderness and just movie star charm. And I think that's really what he excels at. This is a character who... <sighs> It's never that tormented for long, though. We have to be honest. That's a pretty consistent thread about the Pierce Brosnan movies. He gets over trauma pretty quickly. Uh, the most radical version of that will be in Die Another Day, where he will have been, you know, wrecked for months in prison. And then in one night, he's back to being Bond, looking glamorous as ever. There's a sense with Pierce Brosnan's Bond that he is both emotionally sensitive, but wounds just kind of like uh fall off of him very quickly he 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 feels deeply in the moment and then can move past it and tomorrow never dies sets that up pretty quickly i think the rest of the bond movies are that he's in are pretty consistent about that idea that he feels deeply but once he's gotten closure he's able to move past it and get on with the job and move on with his life which is the sense that uh different than the craig movies where you know the death of one woman will haunt Bond for all five of the Daniel Craig movies. In this, it is um, 
much more of a momentary grief and then, you know, punch it back down. It's now in the realm of the subconscious and off you can go with enjoying being James Bond. And for the rest of the movie, he is paired with Wei Lin, played by Michelle Yeoh, um, who I quite enjoy in this movie as a sort of uh, update of the trope we saw in Spy Who Loved Me in the Roger Moore years with Anya Amasova. Uh, here, it is much, it's modernized, right? So again, we get this sense that it's more direct um, that bond could be allied with uh, a spy working for a communist party in the spy who loved me there's a huge to do about that about governments kind of like laying the groundwork before bond is even like forced into it effectively because uh you know the leadership of the of mi6 and the russian uh spy institutions uh kind of come together to say okay we're gonna do this you know, so the KGB and MI6 force Bond to work with an agent. In this, Bond's much more willing. You see the sense of, like, he's accepted the fluidity of the global order um, in that way. And, you know, I think it it is fun to see just the extent to which it leans into her physical capability, which is established to be much greater than that of Brosnan's Bond. Brosnan's Bond is very much the action hero in this and his other movies. Um, in this, he is, you know, at one point, you know, guns in both hands, just creating, like, chaos during the climax. But uh, we do not get the sense that Bond, Brosnan's Bond is ever some sort of athletic wizard. He is not the king of fisticuffs he acquits himself well even in tomorrow never dies he does pretty well during the scene where he's being beaten to death in uh carver's sound booth during the interrogation and he gets the upper hand and turns the tables on them all um but there's a dynamic here uh where he's very clearly established as like left less athletic than his female peer and it's kind of an idea that they will again revisit with Jinx and Die Another Day, um, who who ends up kind of being like another stab at the Waylin prototype, uh, Waylin archetype, much less successful, but again is like, you know, doing backflips as she duels with Miranda Frost on a plane, whereas Bond is just kind of like doing uh, back alley fisticuffs with a, with a Gustav Graves on the deck below, you know, so it th there's... There's a sense with uh, with Brosnan's Bond, these movies are never trying to make him the most athletic guy in the room. And finally, let's just talk about Elliot Carver, who is not really mirrored with Bond in any way. This He's the only villain out of this set to not have a real kind of like personal charge with Bond in a meaningful capacity outside of the Paris encounter, which again... Um, comes up in dialogue uh, a, a bit, but is really kind of promptly forgotten about when Bond and Carver are really facing off in the third act. Um, Carver seems to stand in for this sort of maniacal businessman ca character in a way that the Brosnan movies don't really revisit it again. You kind of see it with Electric King, but there's a lot more going on with the psychology, psychology of Electric King and and you got to give Jonathan Price credit. He leans into this really, really hard, um, just creating the most insanely larger than life character that he can with this material. I I uh, there's not a lot to say, though, about what he's reflecting about Bond beyond the fact that they are just kind of men who are so totally different from one another. Um, in Goldeneye, you saw that weird moment with Bond, Trevelyan, and Natalia on the train that established a kind of like weird sort of love triangle between them. Um, not really full on, but like this sort of 
uh, sort of like implied jealousy on Trevelyan's part of Bond's exploits and success with women. Um, and again, you see this element kind of creep into the relationship with Carver, particularly in their early scenes together at the party, where uh, Bond comes into the picture in the middle of Carver kind of having a bit of a tiff with his his wife Paris, as it's as it's clear that their romance is kind of dying on the vine, um, and that they have been presumably unfaithful to one another um and bond kind of comes into that picture there's a bit of there's a bit of resentment there and carver leans into it in the finale when he he talks to bond about bond not being able to resist any anything in his possession um referring to waylon and this sort of like one-upping bond on sort of that sort of like uh you know, machismo scale is something that's very interesting. And as, as far as I can tell, not hugely done in, in this sort of like personal digs way that in prior Vaughn films, this is a very, uh, this is, this comes in very much in this Brosnan era of Bond as a trope that is explored here. Um, there's a kind of interesting, like, reverse version of it in The World Is Not Enough that we'll talk about. I think The World Is Not Enough has a lot to talk about. It's a very interesting um, Bond movie in the scheme of things. Um, but I'll wrap it up here. I am getting to the 30-minute mark, and Tomorrow Never Dies being one of the shorter Brosnan Bond movies uh, probably didn't deserve as much uh, me being as long-winded as I've, as I've been. Hopefully you found my comments interesting. I'm really excited to talk about The World's Not Enough in the next video, but let me know what you think about uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, what you think about Bond's portrayal in Tomorrow Never Dies, how you feel that it, it, it successfully or not so successfully picks up where Goldeneye left off, and in the next episode we will talk about The World's Not Enough.